The sermon for this Sunday is based on the second reading, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 to 10. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. When I am weak, then I am strong. An interesting comment to make and quite countercultural. The general culture of the world seems to love power. Forever and a day, nations have tried to gain power over other nations. In the last 60 odd years, nations have tried to harness the power of the atom. We have the Olympics, the Commonwealth Games and various World Cups. Those with the power to win or second set records become rich and famous if they aren't already. Maybe what's wanted by many closer to home is the money and power to build a dream home and own a car that has the technological power to go from zero to 100 in seven seconds and yet get 700 kilometres out of a tank. Power brings respect. Power is very cool. Many movies have portrayed power on our screens. But is the desire for power only found outside of the church? Well, it was pretty important in some parts of the church in the first century, and it's still the case today. Many look to the name of Christ in order to experience and revel in the power of a miracle. Many see the name of Christ as the answer to financial wealth as the way to find self-fulfillment and a life that's completely free of problems. While many in the church start out by trying to find out what their particular gift is so that they can use it for the good of others, many unfortunately fall into the trap of lording their gift over others. One of those gifts might even be biblical knowledge. Some would say pastors need to be careful with the power they have the potential to abuse. Unfortunately, even in the church, there is the love of power in various forms, and it's always been the case. Now, if we had to pick just one character from the Bible who was endowed with spiritual greatness and power, many of us would probably choose St Paul. Paul saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. He spoke in tongues more than anyone. In today's reading, we hear how he knew a man who was even caught up to paradise. But was this his focus? Was this what he urged others to experience? No. He was forced to mention these things to those who thought they were superior to him and were leaving the true faith. He made himself, in his words, a fool by boasting about these things. He did so reluctantly because he understood something that the enthusiasts in Corinth who valued eloquence, wisdom and power didn't understand. He understood the glory of weakness. Paul had more reasons than any to be full of pride over his spiritual experiences and the Corinthians would have been all in for that. But when he mentions the thorn, he bursts his own balloon. To say that he had, had a constant weakness would have been like blotting his resume. But whether or not the Corinthians or Christians today think it's a good thing, it's the truth. And it strikes at the heart of the gospel. This thorn, this suffering and hardship is usually more central to a Christian's reality than the blessings of a wonderful spiritual experience. Maybe some of you have experienced great and miraculous gifts and visions like Paul and like some of the Corinthian Christians who were puffed up by them. But you would also have likely experienced a thorn that gives you some kind of grief and makes you feel weak. Weakness isn't what our society prizes as a virtue. And let's face it, we don't naturally see it as a good thing. But it's celebrated by Paul, even if it's celebrated by very few others. I think that one of the reasons we fight against weakness is that most human ideas of what a good Victorian, victorious Christian life should look and feel like are different to God's ideas. 
Just as most human ideas of how a supremely powerful God should work are different to God's ideas. Even God's idea of how we would be saved involved weakness. When Christ was displaying his true power and glory and saving the world from sin, he was the epitome of weakness. As St Paul says in chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians, to be sure, he was crucified in weakness. Maybe that's because God came to save the weak, the sick, the poor, us sinners. Weakness is a blessing because it keeps us from pride. It leads us to the Saviour who tells us, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Living the Christian life is not about our personal power. It's about God's power in the midst of our personal weakness. Christianity is not about spiritual highs. It's not about the power that can be seen in amazing gifts, in material wealth, in a problem-free life. Christianity is about the powerful grace and love of God who became weak, who is with us in our weakness, who will ensure that our bodies are laid to rest, sown in weakness, but raised in power for eternity. As Christians, we're set free to accept our human nature. It's the nature that God loves so much that he took it on himself and was tested in it, wept in it, and suffered and died in it. Now, as is written in Hebrews, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weakness, but we have one who has been put to the test in every way, just as we are. We can accept who we are and we can rely on the sympathy and compassion of God. When we see a frog, we can be reminded to fully rely on grace, but also fully rely on God. We are saved by grace and we keep living under grace. Grace that keeps us united to Jesus. Each of us can be secure in our identity and sure of our infinite worth, even as we experience weakness and struggles like he did. Because God's grace and power is only perfected in weakness, we can accept our vulnerability and be free from trying to pretend to ourselves or others about our personal power and worth. So what's your thorn? What's that problem or issue? Maybe physical, or emotional that you just want to be rid of. Well, whatever it is, God might be thinking differently about it. You see, he knows about it. He could take it away, and maybe he will in his own time. But there will always be a trial or temptation so long as we live on this earth. To ensure that we're brought to fully rely on God's all-sufficient grace, as a church and as individual Christians, the experience of weakness is to be expected. Jesus even tells us, in this world you will have trouble, he says in John 16. But we don't need to be afraid or ashamed of what looks like weakness in worldly terms. We have the promise that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. God is on our side. Through struggle and weakness, God works to draw us closer to himself. He grows us to rely more fully on his grace, his powerful love that can only be perfected in weakness. He kills pride and makes room in us to grow faithfulness, trust, patience and humility. Whatever the thorns are that we experience as a church or as a dearly loved child of God, Keep praising our God who works in mysterious ways. His love is unfailing. He's the master craftsman making masterpieces. And through us, God can channel his love and acceptance to others struggling with their own thorns. So they too can know Christ 
and say with St Paul and with us, when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen.